All right, everybody, we are going to go ahead and get started. Um, hello. Hello, all, and welcome uh, to the fourth installment, the fourth edition of uh, Aspen Germany's COVID in Tech series. Uh, my name is Tyson Barker, and I'm the deputy director here at the Aspen Institute Germany, and I'm delighted uh, to have you guys all join us today. Uh, we are in for quite a treat, a great discussion on uh, Germany mobilizing tech. Uh, before we jump into the discussion, just a couple of quick ground rules. First, this is on the record and will be posted to YouTube later. Um, we are doing this in partnership with Google and we're gonna hear a little bit about what Google's doing in this space, particularly in Germany, uh, in the discussion, but I think we're all aware of the work they've been doing uh, with Bluetooth technology, uh, looking at uh, social tracing apps, um, as well as research, uh, looking for uh, cure, uh, using AI and, and other areas of remote learning, et cetera. So I'm sure we'll hear more. Um, I think uh, in the meantime, most people are pretty fluent in Zoom, but if you're not, uh, just a couple of uh, things to note. We want this conversation to be as interactive as possible, so we'll have some polls, uh, and we want to hear questions from you guys, questions and comments from the audience. So if you have a question and would like to ask it verbally, all you have to do is raise your hand. There's a little hand icon at the bottom. Um, and if you raise your electronic hand, we will call on you. You can also write your question in the Q&A and we will read it out loud. I'll read it and we'll get the answer from the, the audience. Or if you're dialing in, if you hit star nine, you can ask a question on the phone as well. Questions, please say your name and affiliation. So um, we will make sure that we can get uh, some sense of who is who we're talking to. Um, so without further ado, uh, we want to jump into this conversation on Germany Mobilizes Tech. The real genesis of this conversation was the, the hackathon that took place, I think, around a little over a month ago, which was a moment of, in a dark time, this is a really dark time, a kind of a bright spot, you know, a, the sense that the, Germany was really grasping the moment to marshal the spirit of its founders, its innovators, uh, to try to come up with solutions. And, uh, we started to see these kind of bright spots all over the place uh, in really interesting places, including remote learning, including events like this on Zoom. And we wanted to really get topography of what was happening. Of course, in the meantime, there has been a little bit more complexity in the euphoria that we were experiencing initially. Um, there are questions about, for example, resources getting to startups uh, to implement some of those solutions. Um, there are questions about trade-offs that are taking place uh, within the social contract. You know, are, uh, are, what are we doing to make sure that ec economic and social inequality aren't being exacerbated uh, by technological instruments that are helping build resilience in this crisis? Um, how are we dealing with data protection and privacy? And what are the big ethical questions that we're talking about? And we had a conversation a couple of weeks ago on AI and we were talking about optimizing uh, hospital functions, but of course we're dealing with really, really big, deep ethical questions when you're talking about triage. Um, and finally, we wanna make sure that we don't go down the route of uh, digital solutionism. Uh, you know, ascribing technology too much uh, agency in questions that really come back to us. So to answer these kind of big questions, we have four excellent speakers, and I'm gonna introduce them briefly. Uh, Christina Lang is, Director of Tech for Germany. Uh, prior to that, she was a strategy consultant at McKinsey um, and worked at the Federal Foreign Office's uh, Digitization Task Force and was one of the kind of guiding lights behind the, the hackathon. So welcome, Christina. Uh, Thomas Jatzombeck is a member of the German Bundestag uh, from Nordrhein-Westfalia. He is also the Economic Affairs, Min Economic Affairs Ministry's Commissioner uh, for digital industry and startups, as well as the federal coordinator for German aerospace. So he has aerospace policy. So he's dealing with the bottom area, the bottom up and the top down, very capital intensive on one side and, and all the great ideas of the, on the other side. Uh, our third speaker is uh, Peter Albitz, who is the managing director of Pfizer Germany. And I would say, Peter, you're kind of a lifer uh, at Pfizer. You've been there for uh, about 25 years since 1996, rising up through the ranks and 
Of course, he's going to talk to us a little bit about the, the vaccine situation right now and the, the clinical trials that are taking place and, and making that international headlines. Um, and finally, we have uh, Jens Redma, who is the head of product policy at Google. Um, prior, and he's kind of a lifer too. He's been there since 2005, which is an eternity in, in tech years. Um, but prior to that, he worked in other areas, including for uh, the world's largest independent television producer. Um, and I'm sure he's going to talk a lot about the different aspects that, that Google is, is, is dealing with these questions. So let, without further ado, let me start with you, Christina. Christina, you were really involved at the front lines of the hackathon. Uh, great euphoria. What were some of the good ideas that came out of it and where do we stand with those now? Um, I think probably it all is kind of twofold because we have to look at the methods and the process that we implemented with starting like, um, organizing a hackathon that's now being followed up with a solution program for around 150 of the best ideas that we saw. And we did not only invite um, teams from the, part, uh, from the hackathon to participate in the solution program, but also other initiatives that have sparked um, the weeks prior to the start of the program. I think it's very important in times like this to be inclusive with uh, programs that we do. So we didn't want to limit it to the programs that participated, uh, sorry, the teams that participated in the hackathon. Um, the hackathon itself, I think was special in the sense that we did not upfront give the challenges to teams, but we opened up um, it to the public to submit challenges as well as being able to participate. And so we had a super broad area of um, topics that people were able to work on over this weekend. Um, the solution span from health. So we have um, teams that looked into uh, how, how can technology support clinical trials, how can um, medical equipment be produced but also be distributed, so like kind of a matchmaking idea. We also had teams looking into tracing solutions and um, we had the whole area of uh, public life. So um, border control support that's already being um, implemented or being in, in discussion with, with uh, the federal police force now. We had also but local things like neighborhood support and things like that. Um, big topic was also the um, government and administration support in the current times that helps people apply for short-time compensation that's already being used with the employment agency. So that's like a super quick success example. Um, we have um, apps that help with fact-checking or um, information apps, um, for example, for uh, Germans abroad that um, provide them with uh, current information on the situation back home and how to um, best deal with the situation abroad. Um, all the way to, to private life, so homeschooling, but also like the not so nice uh, sides to this crisis, like domestic violence or caregiving, care of dying, um, very broad uh, themes that were being uh, discussed. I mean, well, they're broad themes, but really important. And you see how much infrastructure needs to be kind of thrown up at once, you know, to deal with getting uh, people back home, to deal with domestic violence, to get education happening online, to deal with um, capacity, uh, logistical capacity in hospitals and public administration. Uh, Thomas, these are, these are big questions. These are questions that the government has to deal with. How is the government absorbing these great ideas and making sure they're being implemented? Yeah, so that's the point. And uh, to be honest, so this initiative is hosted by the Chancellery and I guess they have all the tools to implement that wherever. So our focus in our Ministry for Economic Affairs is more to focus on the opportunities of digitalization right now and also on the startup scene that needs some kind of support. Mm. And so how, so let's, let's talk about the startup scene perhaps uh, very briefly. Uh, venture capital is dried up, you know, people are in a cautious mood, the, the turtles' heads are going into the shell, uh, and startups are, you know, undercapitalized. How do we make sure that the startup scene in Germany emerges from this experience resilient? Yes, we started, when, 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 we, when the crisis came up, we started with several programs and these are, some of them are also um, available for startups. So that means uh, what we call in Germany Kurzarbeitergeld, that means that the government takes the cost uh, for wages of workers. And um, so this is something where also uh, startups can benefit from. Also a lot of companies it was a very successful model already in the financial crisis in 2008 around. And um, the second thing is that uh, we uh, focus on our financial authorities so that they can help companies to gain liquidity. 
uh, these are instruments that help startups. On the other hand, we have a lot of tools for companies uh, from our um, national bank, from the KFW, which uh, support companies that uh, gained profit over the last three years. And uh, there comes the point where a lot of startups are out because the business model of a startup typically is not making profits. The business model is typically to, to gain a market range and therefore to raise venture capital. And you're right, uh, the situation is quite dried out for venture capital. And so therefore, we are just starting a new program with uh, 2 billion euros for startups. And that has two columns. One uh, first column uh, goes exactly to the venture capital funds that we can make a matching up to 70% of public money. Uh, to support uh, financial rounds uh, for, for these startups that need support in that crisis. And the second thing is that we can make uh, direct support for smaller startups that are financed, for instance, by business angels or are bootstrapped with up to 800,000 euros. And the program will start over the next days. And we are sure that the first startups can benefit from that uh, right now in May. Hey, I mean, that's, that's fantastic. Very impressive. Um, I know that there's been a lot of talk politically uh, from the Greens, Danny Baez, Anna Kuzman, some tech uh, politicians about the role that uh, the government needs to play in kind of fostering uh, indigenous uh, startup technology, um, that space here in Germany. But are you at all worried about the role that the government could play in picking winners and losers? How are you kind of checking to make sure that you're not picking companies that aren't really competitive. Yeah, that's a fair point. That's a fair point. And we don't want uh, to make government decisions that, that show for the one company uh, in, a, in a good way and for the others in a bad way. So the model to explain that um, we are co-investing over the years now in, in all these large startup funds. And uh, so we have a quite good track record. We invested around the 4 billion euros over these years. In the last two years, now the period of being the Minister for Economic Affairs, we doubled this amount to 8 billion euros. Now there are these 2 billion euros coming on top. And additionally, we are working on it in the second half of this year for a thing that's called the Future Fund with an additional 10 billion euros so that in the end we will have a co-investment scheme of 20 billion euros. I guess that's oh. a very impressive amount of money, uh, just saying it's uh, twice the amount that France is investing here right now. And uh, so as, as there are a lot of international uh, uh, people here in this webinar, I can uh, say, just come to us. You can send me an email if you want to invest in Germany, good place, strong startups, cool technology. And we have a very, very attractive co-investing scheme. And how does it work? It works in a way that we are uh, saying, if you have a, a piece, if you are a venture capitalist, uh, we make a due diligence with your fund and then uh, the KFW or the European Investment Fund can invest an amount of 20%, 25%, in some instances up to 40%. And so they pay this money into your fund and then you can make your deals without having to ask them. And uh, this is the answer to your question. Not we are the ones deciding this is a good startup or this is a bad startup their investors will decide. And I think there are four groups of startups. The first ones are, so to say, the ones where the investor does not believe in their future anymore and he will not invest there. And so we are also not going to invest there. The second group can be the ones that don't need any support right now. Maybe they are working with artificial intelligence or data analysis and uh, so this crisis will not affect on them. Uh, the third group are the ones that are affected right now because uh, they, they, um, they, they have a problem on the market side and they have, the investors will maybe say, so we want to support these. They need, they need our, um, our Corona matching fund, how's it, how's it called? And, and the third group can be the, the stars that benefit from it. For instance, HelloFresh is a company uh, publicly listed in Germany and HelloFresh uh, they raised uh, the, the, the worth on the, uh, on the capital side is higher than from a lot of traditional companies. And, and so they went up there delivering uh, uh, cook, cook things uh, to homes. And so you have these companies that are kind of stars. 
And, and for these last two groups, where investors decide they want to make a further investment, there we will co-invest. And it's a sharing of risk in the end. And that's important for us that there has to be a private investor who believes in that company. And this is the major, major point uh, for our decisions. We'll definitely go to uh, Christina in a second to get her reaction and say how that's being uh, taken up by, by the startup community here in Berlin and in Germany. But first to Peter, um, shifting track a little bit, you know, we're talking about uh, a little bit about social tracing apps. We're talking about uh, logistics for public administration, border, uh, we're talking about uh, home office, uh, remote learning, all this great stuff. But this is all kind of the stuff around the big question in the middle, which is how do we get to a vaccine? I mean, all of these technologies that we're rolling out in exit strategies are bridges or to build resilience until we get to this vaccine. So where do we stand in that search? Yeah, thanks, Tyson. Um, I'm happy to share um, um, where we are. I mean, th I think the first point here is um, you know, we'll need to be aware that man, this is a historic challenge. It's probably the biggest um, global health challenge in a century, right, which we are facing. So in a way, uh, a one-time call for action. And what we're seeing uh, is what I would say an unprecedented uh, effort of pharmaceutical companies, of biotech companies around the world and in bringing their sources, expertise uh, into that battle. Um, currently, I think, mean, you know, we have about probably 80 um, um, development programs underway already of different companies on working on a, on a vaccine. So I think quite a, quite a significant move and effort uh, of those companies. In regard to Pfizer, um, Pfizer, Pfizer has decided to go bold um, in fighting the battle against COVID-19. We've set up and laid out a five point plan, uh, which is in a way a call to action for industry collaboration and uh, you know, co consists also of, of commitments we've, we've made. Um, one is you know, we've built an open source platform where we share our knowledge and expertise uh, as we move forward. We've, we've built a SWAT team of, of internal experts, uh, clinicians, um, vaccine experts, epidemiologists, etc., uh, who are fully dedicated on, on COVID-19. And, and third, I think that, that leads us to, to the question, uh, we bring our expertise into one, you know, develop a vaccine, I think, you know, as a core priority, but also on parallel working uh, on developing a potential medicine uh, to treat um, people who are infected. So, you know, we have different pathways where we work on. Uh, in terms of vaccines, I think that the core uh, collaboration here is a, uh, is a partnership with BioNTech. Uh, BioNTech is a Germany, German based company in Mainz. Um, BioNTech is, uh, I would say, probably one of the world leading companies when it comes to the new cutting edge technology of messenger RNA um, developed and uh, based um, on vaccines, which is completely new. Um, uh, and and they, are, they have uh, this built up this technology platform. We've joined up um, forces and expertise with them. And I think the, the news you might have heard of is um, we've been able to start the first study on a COVID-19 vaccine in Germany. Uh, just about two weeks ago, uh, first patients now have been dosed. Um, so I think that's that's pretty promising. I would say, I mean, to put that in perspective, um, you know, usually and in former times, the development of a vaccine has taken years, uh, sometimes a decade or longer, uh, because your know, pharmaceutical R and D is a, a big time, longer term development. I mean, here, um, I think roughly about, I would say, four months ago, I had first consultation that started between the two companies. And about four months later, we've dosed the first patients uh, in the first clinical trial. I mean, this is, I just think this is kind of unprecedented uh, in terms of the speed uh, which is taken. And others are moving also very fast. So I think this is, this is quite promising um, to see. But now I think, you know, now we have to see how the clinical trials will, will develop further, uh, how, it, how it will further move. One other aspect is important. I mean, the development of a vaccine is a challenge. And as you said, you know, everybody, the world is looking at it. You just need to imagine another aspect of this. I mean, this pandemic kind of is, is threatening the world. I mean, threatening uh, uh, people around the world. So once we have the vaccines, the second biggest question is how are we able then to produce it at this scale and at this size so that we are able to supply patients around the world. I think this is also something I think we've never faced uh, in this dimension. So 
manufacturing, manufacturing capability uh, to be built up is critically important. And I think, you know, on parallel to the R&D efforts now, we're investing at risk, at risk in building up significant manufacturing capabilities so that we aim and shoot for uh, 2021, uh, that we are able to, to produce hundreds of millions of doses. So I think all of this, you know, is, is just showing, you know, there is a huge and significant effort so, so that we, you know, come to find a solution and you know, hopefully we'll be able um, to overcome this challenge. Let me, you, you mentioned this, the second question, which people sometimes don't think about, but is really important, which is just producing this thing once it exists. Maybe the space that we're more familiar with really producing the vaccine itself. You mentioned that uh, Pfizer is working on this in parallel. So is your expectation that the capacity to produce, mass produce this vaccine will be available once the vaccine exists? And if so, can you estimate how long it will take to really ramp up that production so that we're all living our lives again? So the, the ramping up uh, of the production is going to start. So that's kind of what, what you know, Pfizer and BioNTech are, have started you know, to work on. So over the next month, you know, towards the end of the year, we will ramp it up, we'll scale it up. So that, you know, the rough estimate, the end of this year, we'll, you know, and hopefully if everything works, have millions of doses in that range, be able to be produced and then supplied and then into 2021. And I think that's the big kind of scaling up. Um, we would be able to produce of, uh, millions of doses, as, as, as I said. And, and that required, you know, a huge kind of investment and ramping up of, of, of production capabilities so in the US, but also in Europe, you know, in, in all those places. So while we move, right, we'll figure out what the, what the places for this will be. But it's, I think, and that's important to know, we don't know yet if we will be successful with the vaccine. Right. We, are, we, are, we are confident, I mean, we have expertise and I, th I think the technology is really promising. And, and if we would be able to develop it, I think that would be a breakthrough to have this new technology and then a vaccine build on it. Um, um, but you know, we need to invest now, and that's what we do. We don't wait till the vaccine is developed. Um, uh, we go now and build it up. And, build it. and one thing I should say also, what we also say is, you know, across the companies, I mean, there's a big spirit. Of course, everyone you know, is, is fully committed and dedicated to develop a vaccine or a medicine, but there's also a joint collective spirit. I mean, whoever will be successful, you know, companies will, will work together and ensure that this, that this vaccine will be produced. And very clearly, I mean, that's a commitment uh, also from our side. If we would not be the one who had yeah. the first vaccine, another one would be, of course, I mean, we will collaborate and, and, and support each other uh, amongst the industry. It needs the joint effort. No company alone will be able right, to overcome this challenge. So we need a big joint effort there. Uh, and that commitment is there. You can, you can hear it, hear it uh, across, across the, the whole city. So it sounds like uh, there is a recognition in the industry that production capacity is somewhat of a public good and that you shouldn't be holding on to this proprietarily because that could lead to bottlenecks. I'm sure we're going to have questions on that. I have questions on that. But before we uh, go more deeply into that, I want to talk to Jens a little bit. Uh, Jens, you're at Google. Google is kind of, you know, we talk about general purpose technologies. Google is kind of a general purpose company. It kind of does a little bit of everything. Um, you, you know, from your standpoint, where have you been most surprised at the kind of turbocharge of technology, particularly in Germany? So I think if you, if you talk about technology, um, you mentioned it a little bit in your uh, introductory remarks. Technology is not going to solve all the challenges that we face with, with COVID-19. I mean, it, it, it undoubtedly is uh, unprecedented in, uh, in, in the last 100 years, as Peter also il um, alluded to it just, just now. Um, we're trying to help where we can. And uh, as you mentioned, Tyson, there's, there's a couple of industries where we have uh, overlap, where we can help, uh, we, which we're basically trying to concentrate our efforts on a number of pillars. One pillar is what we call information, so where we can, where we can help uh, guide users uh, and partners to the right level of information. So if you have seen on, in the last past weeks, if you searched for COVID-19 related uh, search queries on YouTube or on search, you would uh, you'll be linked to to see info boxes on corona uh, and uh, covid 19 related topics guiding you to websites that provide you with authoritative information so in germany we work with the health ministry 
the Robert Koch Institute and other subsidiaries of the health ministry to, to get users fast to where they can find authoritative and validated information. Uh, we're also tackling false and misleading information on, on platforms like YouTube. Um, we, we also want to help uh, users in identifying scam uh, and, and, others, and other material. So we're trying to we're trying our best in the information bucket, which is the first bucket where, we, where we're trying to, um, to help with technology. The second bucket is education, where we are linking users to, uh, to resources where they can find more information on how do I educate in this, in this new in this new normal scenario, um, how can we provide tools for free where teachers and students can get access to more information to, to get trained online and to use tools to train their students and, um, uh, and their, uh, their uh, pupils. Uh, and the third bucket is SMBs. How do we, how do we help businesses of all sizes uh, in this unprecedented challenge? Uh, how do we help them in getting trained? How do we help them in getting um, better advertising on, on our services. Uh, we also launched uh, advertising funds and relief funds to financially support SMBs of all sizes. Um, and there's a number of additional services also in the research space where some of our experts and various, and various uh, companies, also sister companies of Google and the Alphabet um, Corporation, um, we'll also start helping in the research, uh, research space where some of our tools, some of our expertise can also be used by the medical community. So there's a number of things that we are doing and we're trying to be helpful um, wh wherever we can inject some of the technology to, uh, to provide solutions for users, for partners and ultimately for society. Oh, thanks. Thanks so much, Jens. This, that was a great uh, lead in. Uh, we want to open it up for questions now from the uh, audience, from the group. We've got about 80 people on the call right now. Um, some uh, on phone. If you hit star nine, you can raise your hand on the phone. Um, otherwise, just raise your hand down below or type in your question. Um, before we get to the questions for the audience, I see we have one right now. Um, we want to put up a poll. So, uh, Toby, if you can put up the poll very quickly. Anybody can participate except for the people on the, on the phone or the, the, the speakers themselves. So the first question we have, a lot of these issues have been talked about, is in which area has Germany been most successful in the, in the crisis so far? Has it been in scientific and medical research? That's the first one. Development and application of tracing apps. Uh, the fight against online disinformation, that's the third. Mobilizing and inter uh, implementing uh, solutions from startups, that's the fourth. Uh, transferring tel uh, to teleworking and online education models is the fifth. And closing gaps regarding access to digital infrastructure is the sixth. And I know that there are a ton of other issues. Many of them have just been mentioned. Um, but just out of these six, where do you see Germans, Germany's real strengths having, having been uh, on, on display in the past two months? So we'll give everybody a second to, to answer that and also to start to raise their hands if they have questions or to type questions into the Q&A box. Um, and give it one more second. In fact, we have a question from somebody, uh, which I'll ask while people are answering these. It's to uh, Thomas Jotzenbeck. It says, hi, Thomas. Uh, can you comment on whether business angels will be eligible for pillar one of the matching fund? So very... <laughs> Um, yes, no problem. Um, actually, I guess no, because for business angels, there is more intended the second pillar of the program. And for the first one, we are looking at professional VCs, and it's important to have here a VC structure um, that has an independent investment committee where you have a GP and LPs, and um, there is a kind of stability. Because in the end, uh, maybe we have shares of company that we have to keep for 10 years. And so we need a solid construction on that. And a construction that's independent from decision-making process of a single person. So in the end, if you're a business angel, super angel, a family office or whatever, you can make yourself compatible for the program. And if you do this and you establish such kind of uh, structure, you have a second advantage. Uh, you can use the co-investment vehicles I've spoken, uh, 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 I've spoken about. Uh, you can use these co-investment vehicles like the KF or the IVE also for your future investments. And therefore, I just recommend uh, going this way. Just call the KFW Capital. They can tell you more about all the details. 
that are necessary and how you can make yourself uh, eligible for that process. Okay, uh, thanks for that. Um, let's go ahead and take a look at the poll results and then we'll get to some other questions. All right, so we have the results. Uh, I'm going to read it for the people who are dialing in. Uh, in which area has Germany been most successful in uh, the crisis thus far? 66% uh, of respondents said uh, scientific and medical research. Uh, number two was 20% uh, for transferring to teleworking and online education models. So real große um, Lob, uh, as the Germans would say, on, on companies like Pfizer. Um, and, and those looking at really the race for the cure. Uh, so definitely something that we don't wanna get lost in when we talk a lot in the tech world about tracing apps is actually how do we wanna cure this thing. Now we have a couple questions, uh, both typed in and uh, calls. Um, if we can have the person who's dialed in, whose number ends in 921, uh, number 921, you are on, and please identify yourself as well, name and affiliation, and who your question is for. Yes, hello. Do you hear me? Yes. Hi. Okay, my name is Günther Tau from the company TBS. Uh, I have a specific question to Peter because I've met him last uh, November and December in uh, because of the event of the health cluster. And um, I would like to ask Peter, is it realistic to develop a vaccine in less than two years when a blockbuster takes minimum 10 years? And the second question, what about the use of the molecular data bank of the project of the Technical University of Berlin and the Free University. Is it already widespread that someone can use these data? Okay, thanks. Two very good questions. Peter? Yeah, I think that, that exactly, I think, shows the dimension of the challenge. Uh, so your question is, is absolutely right. From a, a perspective, you know, traditional perspective, we would say, it's, it looks un impossible, right? With, with kind of historic experiences in, in developing um, uh, medicines and, and vaccines. Uh, yeah, I think um, here we have a chance. We don't know yet, but we have a chance that we are able to come to a vaccine much earlier and faster uh, than, than, than in previous times. So, so why, why, why do I think it is that? I mean, one is I, I shared uh, I mean, probably you know, never we had such a global mobilization you know, of companies around the world throwing their expertise, knowledge, and capabilities on finding a solution, finding a vaccine or, or uh, a medicine. I, I just had 80, 80 projects underway and much more probably in other, other regions in the world. So huge, significant effort and expertise from, from all in one. Second, I mean, just looking at it from, from our perspective, there is pre-experience, uh, which we have. So... Uh, from a Pfizer perspective, we had experiences uh, in regard of, of, of medical treatments uh, in the former, you know, SARS epidemics, right? SARS and MERS. So there was work on the way where we, where we understood uh, at least, you know, some of the principles um, uh, and potential targets, et cetera, and have started to work on, work on this. So there is, there is kind of knowledge and expertise there. And third, um, we, and then now I'm talking about the, the collaboration with, with BioNTech. There has been built up expertise in this messenger RNA technology, uh, which, which I talked about from BioNTech, but also you know, we had a collaboration since 2018 um, uh, working on a messenger RNA um, a vaccine for a different indication. So there is a lot of pre, you know, kind of knowledge and expertise. Um, and, and last point, as I said, you know, we are throwing big, bold you know, expertise, efforts, investment into it. So you take all of this together, this does, this does not guarantee we're getting there, but it I kind of, I mean, makes the, seem the, un, the impossible, it makes it at least you know, um, uh, imaginable that we are able to get much faster uh, to a vaccine. So to be proven, but we are committed to do everything, everything we can. In regard of the, the platform you've described, I'm not personally familiar with it, but it would be definitely worth to have a look at it. So feel free to connect, uh, connect with me, and then we could further talk about it. It's important, I think that's what we also discussed. It's important that we create connectivity between platform databases so that we can start collaborating. And, and that was the aspect I mentioned first. So one part of the five point plan is that we have created ourselves an open, um, uh, open source platform and we have started to share uh, uh, progress, knowledge, expert, 
expertise uh, on our progress on, on medical treatments. So happy for you, you know, to, to get back uh, to me and follow up on this. Thank you. All right, thanks, Peter. Um, we have a question from uh, Lindsay, who uh, has a question for Jens, and it's uh, concerning Google and disinformation. Uh, many of the sources spreading COVID-19 disinformation that is harmful to uh, the public are the same sources that spread disinformation in the political and social areas. Uh, to what extent is the tech world focused on COVID-19 disinformation, and to what extent uh, does this need to be situated in the problematic context in general? So. Uh, how does this look? Is it similar to what we're seeing in just traditional disinformation? And, and what are the sources? And, and are these lessons that we're learning from COVID-19 applicable to, say, elections? So, you know, f fake news and misinformation is nothing new. Um, it, hasn't, uh, it hasn't been invented only through COVID-19, but there are also specific uh, questions around COVID-19 in that, in that space. So it, it becomes even more important to have a closer look at that. Um, what we have done in the past in this first bucket that I described earlier, the information bucket, is to make sure, to making sure that people are guided to authoritative information. Um, and then also provide tools and services within our platforms and within our services and products that guide people to uh, this authoritative information, even if they see uh, content, links to websites um, that may contain uh, misleading information. Uh, and in addition, we're also trying to identify, to, to detect misleading information and demote uh, their visibility in, uh, in, in our products as well. And lastly, we're also working with a number of fact-checking fact uh, organizations um, and neutral institutions that help us to create better products, um, but that also get funded through a number of initiatives that, that Google or our um, associated companies are doing. Um, to help to, to help further promote good and authoritative news and to demote fake and misleading news. There's a product that we have launched in the US and that is currently under localization and translation, which is a product to help end users identifying scams, identifying fraud solutions in, in, in your email, in, um, in uh, official websites or uh, uh, websites that look official that claim to be you know, the, the, the health ministry or the uh, economic ministries of countries. Um, and we have seen that and we are trying to demote all of that and also inform our users. Um, and so there's a lot of cooperation. There's a lot of partnership with governments, with um, public institutions, and ultimately also we're building a lot of products in this, in this space. Uh, so we are, we're, we're always on the, on the lookout for additional ideas. So if you have additional ideas, just keep them coming. Uh, this is a, a quest that is not, uh, and, a, and a service that is not, is not finished yet, and we, we're, still, we're still looking for additional input. All right, uh, thank you. Question, we have a question from Ned Wiley, um, and I think that I'm gonna direct, direct this question at Christina, but um, Jens, you might jump in on this as well. Um, how can tracing apps possibly both, uh, possibly both be effective and respect data protection regulations? Doesn't full privacy make apps largely useless? Um, I think probably from a startup or technical point of view speaking, um, the whole concept currently is based on um, the fact that people download the app and use the app voluntarily. So I think this kind of two-step approach that there's a basic set of information that's necessary to um, trace back um, whom people have been in contact with that have a positive test result is something that will be anonymized and then provided um, by everyone who uses that but then on top of that provide data on the the environment those people were in and um, maybe voluntary data um, has to be on a, a voluntary uh, basis uh, then again I think that's a way, good way to go at it and obviously to create transparency and trust by open sourcing the apps, open sourcing the back end, making it visible that there's no um, secret path um, to use the data in a way that's not intended. And that's uh, been a, a source of debate around PEPPT for sure. Um, Jens, uh, what do you have to say? And then and Thomas would like to also jump in on this question. Yeah, so first of all, it's, uh, it's important to have a, to having a look at why these apps uh, or these services are called tracing. Uh, they're not tracking, which is an, a very important distinction. They're not supposed to track the location of users. They're supposed to notify people 
of a possible exposure to someone who have marked themselves again voluntarily voluntarily to uh, to be to be um, to be um, marked as uh, as COVID nineteen positive. So it's not about tracking people. This is about helping them understand in an anonymous fashion whether they potentially have been exposed to someone who has been tested COVID-19 positive. Um, and there's a number of tech companies. Um, Apple and Google have been, have been announcing a partnership uh, a few weeks ago, um, trying to help um, governmental app developers uh, to have their apps run more efficiently, more battery preserving, more privacy preserving um, on the app stores of companies like Apple and Google. So these tech companies will not be producing these apps, will not be creating these apps, will just be helping government created apps to run better, more smoothly and more interoperably um, on the various operating systems, the various devices by many OEMs, by many manufacturers of telephones uh, across the globe. So this is just one step stone, one puzzle piece uh, in, the, in the entire uh, in the entire COVID-19 fight. Um, we're, we're hoping to provide some help to, to the governments through, uh, through allowing these services to run on, uh, on, uh, on the operating systems and to, to help them to be more interoperable. Um, but it's not gonna be the only solution to, uh, to fighting COVID-19. It's just one small puzzle piece. Mm. Uh, Thomas, and you're, you're muted, so unmute. Yeah. So, yes. Um, I think there is a one important thing about that. So uh, we in Germany like to discuss all the day about privacy and uh, how can we get the best privacy solution. And in the end, if you look at the acceptance, we discovered in the past uh, a strange situation that um, public public products, public IT products, have been made so ultra securely that they were not uh, usable anymore. And in the end, people tended to go to the solutions by Google or Facebook or others, and nobody really knows what's happening with the data, right? And I think we need a learning curve out of that. And when we look at this uh, Corona app, it's very important that we have an attractive UX and UI. I think that's the deciding point, and therefore I um, engaged myself very much in that project, and I'm very proud that in the end it's going to be produced by a group of startups and not by these uh, players, like uh, uh, the ones that uh, already have been uh, told which are very successful in the kind of handling with business customers, but not with end users. And uh, so this is very important. And I think this must be the message also for other projects when it comes to e-government. I think the most relevant question for the acceptance is not privacy. I mean, privacy is important, uh, no doubt about that, but that's not the most crucial factor. The most crucial factor is the usability. And uh, I was in a meeting where one of these guys uh, from the startups uh, said, so we want the people to love our app. And I think this is the right message. And this is very important for the future. And I want to hear the people and the colleagues in the Ministry for Interior Affairs, uh, which are developing the e-government applications. I want them to say that they say, so we want our users to love our application. This is the important attitude for getting real acceptance for these kind of solutions. And I'm quite confident that we can achieve that with this uh, Corona app. And we switched a little bit uh, in a kind of uh, how the structure of this application is, but I think we're on the right track right now. I think that's a really important point. If, if these apps, the debate around the apps in Germany has been pretty polarizing. Uh, and you see that in the polling, uh, you know, if, if we assume, and this is a big hurdle to climb, but if you assume that you have to get to 60% adoption uh, and you look at the polls, it's, we're not close because of the people are suspicious of the debate. But what you said is, is right, which it has to be fun. You know, if this is like medicine, people are going to be suspicious and they're just going to leave it. The medicine we leave to Peter. <laughs> we have uh, another question from uh, Frederick Krell. Uh, Frederick Krell, you're up. Please identify yourself and direct your question to somebody. Yes, hello, I'm Frederick Krell. Thank you all very much for this interesting talk and thanks for Aspen for organizing this. Um, yeah, I founded a company in the beginning of the year and I was uh, hit hard by the coronavirus. I had to scrap my first product because of the crisis, um, but 
thanks to the hackathon, I found this rather a big chance. Uh, we are one of the very successful projects there. We benefit, we still benefit from the community, from the non-monetary benefits like coaching sessions and everything. Yeah, and we were one of the 25 projects out of the initially 1,500, you have to imagine this, uh, projects who already secured funding. Um, yeah, my question. Um, there has been a European hackathon. It's also from the name. Uh, seems like it's been a blueprint. It's not V, v versus virus, V versus virus, but it's EU versus virus. And uh, Christina, my question for you, um, how um, did they benefit from your expertise. Uh, what's your view on the European initiatives and, um, and is, is Europe growing together or is Europe uh, splitting apart and is, are, the borders, uh, being, are the borders growing? Uh, thanks, thanks, Frederick. Uh, thanks for advertising the hackathon much better than I ever could. Um, indeed, I think maybe it's important to mention that we also weren't the first to organize a hackathon. We were inspired by the Estonian hackathon um, that happened the weekend prior to the German hackathon and where we heard that they, within 24 hours, um, managed to organize a hackathon where 800 people participated in. I think I read that on a Sunday and approached the, uh, the chancellery, which is the patron uh, our programs under the patronage of the chancellery all year round, um, and suggested if what they can do in a day, we might be able to do in a week. Um, and fair enough, we had over, I think, uh, 40,000 registrations in the end. So it grew a bit uh, further than we had expected. And I think um, the numbers, but also um, the level of engagement, I think the positivity that, that surrounded the, the whole event also on social media, um, also catch some attention in, in Europe. And we were actually um, in close contact with the EU versus virus hackathon organizing team. Um, we in the end decided not to be a full sponsor or like part of the organizing committee of the European hackathon because we saw that a hackathon in itself is not necessarily a solution to every problem and we wanted to focus on providing a support program for the teams that were in our hackathon and uh, basically bring those idea ideas forward. Um, we had some background discussions with the EU um, versus virus hackathon organizing team and um, we provide, provided them with all the information we had. I think this is we're coming a bit more from the social sector side than from, from a, a commercial viewpoint. So we shared all the documentaries and we actually um, just uh, released a handbook um, and how we organize the hackathon. Um, yeah, so I think we were, I think it's an important um, message not to replicate what has been done on a national, le national level now on an EU level and basically start from scratch, but to consolidate um, the best ideas that have already formed themselves um, in the different countries and help um, coordinate or combine um, learn from each other and then bring um, the most um, promising solutions um, forward on a European level as far as Hackerson has been trying to do. And I think there's a follow-up event now with the matchathon that aims to not produce new ideas, but um, see what the best ideas in different countries for various problems that the EU has defined are and, and uh, yeah, support them going forward. Okay, we have um, a couple of questions. I'm going to ask one more and then we're going to take another poll. Um, but we love to hear your voices. So if you are, if you do have a question, uh, rather than typing it, let's hear from you. Uh, raise your hand or, or, or let, uh, let us know that you want to ask that question. Um, this one, I think, is more of a uh, Thomas Yeltsinbeck question, although it's not exactly in your wheelhouse right now. Uh, it's from an anonymous attendee, and it says, uh, how do you deal with infrastructural investment gaps uh, like 5G information platforms that can share the necessary patent and outcomes information? Oh, oh, what is the role of digital information uh, post COVID-19. So I guess it's, it's more about just how in this time are we making sure that infrastructure investment is taking place and that it's uh, being uh, equitably spread around. As we see in, in Germany, two, two, uh, two pillars uh, in this infrastructure situation. The first is that um, all the interconnection points and the backbones, they are working very solid. And we were great in the beginning, as we can see some kind of cold start of digitalization in Germany. A lot of people video conferencing, watching videos also for entertainment when they have to stay at home. 
and so on. And there were some people um, they were afraid that maybe in the end that could be uh, could could become a problem. But we are very glad to see that we had an increase in the uh, volume of on our networks of around 50 percent in peak. Uh, we had no problem at all and all the backbones and interconnection points were solid and, and when I can say so my internet connection at home also is very solid and it delivers the speed that I that I pay for and um, that's an experience not everybody makes but a lot and this is the first thing the second thing is that we still have in Germany uh, an amount of households which don't have a minimum of 50 megabits per second, which is the goal of the government. And therefore we have a problem to set it off very off, often. Uh, uh, we have a problem uh, with the kind we are dealing with building this infrastructure and the process is too complex. And um, households uh, are in rural areas and in Germany, the most, uh, um, the most uh, cities want that all the cables uh, are lying below the earth and so this is uh, very expensive but also the capacities of workers uh, for bringing all these cables below the earth uh, the capacities are uh, filled out and um, therefore we have to change uh, i guess the scheme that we are handling on the broadband uh, programs that we have uh, to reach also these last uh, five to eight percent of people which don't have the coverage that we want to have there. Mm. All right, thank you so much. Let e let's go to the poll, the second poll, um, which is related to the first poll. Uh, actually, this conversation has been extremely constructive, but this is the question about uh, where is the room for improvement? So we have the same options, but uh, the question is in which case, uh, which area does Germany need to show the most improvement? Is it in science, uh, scientific and medical research? That's the first option. Development and application of tracing apps. Uh, third is a fight in online disinformation. Fourth is mobilizing and implementing solutions for startups. Fifth is transferring to teleworking and online education. Is closing the gaps regarding access to digital infrastructure. So the last thing we talked about. So uh, we'll give you guys a second to answer these questions and then we'll look at the answers in a second. Uh, but in the meantime, I'm going to ask a question to, to Peter and to Jens. Really interesting question, um, which is, how do tech companies demonstrate transparency to minimize suspicions around vaccines? Um, and, and maybe, Peter, we'd, I'd like to start with you. Have you experienced, has Pfizer experienced any kind of disinformation campaigns around the development of the COVID-19 vaccine in, in Germany or in Europe? And, and is this on your radar? And then to Jens about how, what you guys are doing about it. Um, so, no, fortunately, not that I would be aware of uh, that, that this has happened and kind of threatened uh, the, the communication around it. So I think that, uh, that that's something I, I, I have not yet seen um, uh, and has worked well. Uh, but of course, I mean, we are uh, aware, you know, that this is a threat. Uh, and of course, you know, um, watch and, and monitor, you know, what's, what's out there, what's happening. So, you know, I think what, what is important, I mean, of course, you know, that yourself, you, you have built up kind of robust uh, communication uh, and, and, and ensure, you know, you know this, this gets a, a broad breach. Uh, and I think the other aspect, the core thing where it comes down to is education, I mean, that we all work together, you know, on education, you know, um, or about vaccination, about those diseases and build the platform. We have lots of experiences built up in other disease areas uh, from a Pfizer perspective, but that is also, you know, applying to uh, other pharmaceutical companies uh, as well and and i think that that is a call for all of us right to further work on on these platforms which really deliver um, um solid in-depth reliable information yeah uh thank you so much i know that uh thomas has to duck out early so he's got a couple minutes left so I'm going to try to get is any questions that are directed to him specifically. If anybody has anything, raise your hand. I've got a couple uh, typed out here. One is a question for Thomas. I think it might be, it's again a question about the matching fund. Uh, it's, do you know when the matching fund will be available and how does the, how the application process will work? Uh, first, let me say sorry when I have to get out, but there is a technical meeting for the Corona app and I'm sorry that I have to switch to there. Um, so the question about the matching fund, yes, um, I said already, uh, we are hopefully that we can uh, uh, start 
right now this month in May, uh, so that the first money will also arrive in May. And in the next days, the KFW Capital uh, will make a Q&A and also open up all the details what to do. Maybe you look on the website of them and we will also make a press announcement on that. All right. Um, okay. Uh, I, I actually wanted to get back to Jens on the question of disinformation around vaccines, and then we're going to see the poll results. Yeah. So, so it's it's, a, it's another question in the in the false information and misleading information uh, bucket. So, uh, as I alluded to earlier, we we have made a couple of uh, technical implementations on some of our platforms, including YouTube. Um, there's also a lot of mechanisms that people and trusted organizations can flag videos um, uh, in many countries, including Germany. We're working with health authorities to, um, to get their help as trusted flaggers for video material, for misleading information that they, that they identify on, on these platforms. Um, and then these, um, these types of videos will be demoted or removed from, from the platform. Even if all of these mechanisms, even if all of these um, um, flagging mechanisms do not from being uh, seen by, a, by, a, by, an, by an end user, on all of these videos, we will still have um, b below the video a box, an information box that provides people to authoritative information by, provided by the public uh, health authorities. So even if you see a video that, that promotes a cons conspiracy theory, even if you see a video that promotes uh, false information on vaccines or any other false information, you will still see a link of, um, of, a, of a, a public body website with links to authoritative information. So there's a lot of stuff that we already are doing. And in addition, as I also mentioned, there's a couple of websites and microsites that we're promoting and building globally to help users identify scams, to identify online fraud, cybercrime, all, all of that with relation to uh, COVID-19 and Corona. And even if you want to promote ads or apps in this space, uh, in, in the Corona space, you will have to get whitelisted. So no one can, uh, can uh, create an advertising campaign promoting a product in the Corona sphere uh, without getting whitelisted first. So which is also an additional tool to help minimize the risk of, uh, of, of getting users to the wrong level of information. So um, we're, we're still working on that, but uh, there's already a couple of good things that have been done. That's, that's really helpful. And it's good to hear uh, from you and from Peter that uh, disinformation around vaccines has not been an issue as much in Germany as some other countries. I know in Pakistan, for example, in the United States, um, definitely something to watch globally. Uh, we have one final question. I'm going to give this final question to Thomas because I know he's got to duck out um, and then we'll get to the poll results. It's from Wolfgang and he says, uh, what we see uh, in this crisis is uh, a rise in organized cybercrime. And he's directed this question at you as well, uh, Thomas. Uh, could Corona become also a push for enhanced international cooperation to strengthen cybersecurity, to make global arrangements, like to protect the uh, public core of the internet as global critical infrastructure? What are we seeing in the, the cybercrime space? Oh, did he, we lose him? It looks like it looks like he had to jump off. <laughs> he literally ducked, ducked so, off. It, it, it is a tough question, tough but fair. We'll we'll try to get you an answer on that question uh, later, uh, Wolfgang. Um, let's go ahead and take a look at the the poll. All right, we've got some pretty evenly distributed answers. Well, no, actually, we. It looks like the big answer is is uh, closing the gaps regarding digital infrastructure. Perennial uh, policy challenge in Germany, 48% uh, of respondents said that this is an area where Germany needs the most improvement, followed by transferring to teleworking and online uh, education models, and then uh, uh, mobilizing and implementing solutions from startups. So by overwhelming fa almost a majority uh, digital infrastructure, and that and the issue of education models are things that we talked last week with uh, Saskia Esken about. So definitely, definitely on people's minds in Germany. Um, let's go to uh, a question here. It seems like we're getting a lot of disinformation questions. Uh, here we got one, one for Jens. Um, this is, w when do we have a European platform like uh, Kagel, 
maybe you know this, Kegel, uh, to handle better uh, global, uh, future global challenges like uh, 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 pandemics and, and climate. So, so Kaggle is, is, in a, is an international platform. So uh, also any, uh, anybody using this platform in Germany can, can use these platforms. So, um, you know, finding new solutions based on tech uh, is, is one of the core areas that we're, that we're also very passionate about. We support startups in every country on this, on this planet um, and every creative idea that can use technology to help fight uh, a lot of the technical issues and the medical issues that we that we face in the COVID-19 crisis are, are welcome and supported by Google. We're also a very proud supporter of the uh, virus, uh, virus uh, hackathon and other, and other initiatives. Uh, we're funding a lot of startups in Germany, in, in Germany with education tools, with uh, mentorships, um, with uh, credits to some, of our, to some of our usually paid for services. So there's a lot of activity that we're, that we're doing. Um, and uh, you know, platforms like Kaggle can also be used in Germany and other in other countries to to help drive some of the tech solutions to um, that can help in the overall global fight against COVID nineteen. We have a, another question uh, regarding uh, disinformation. Good question. I'm going to give it to Jens, but also to, maybe to uh, Christina, which is uh, how uh, much is uh, false information has to be present before specific channels are demonetized. So. What are the kind of demonetized metrics that you guys have in place, maybe at Google, YouTube, that kind of thing? And, and, and for Christina, I'm just gonna build off of this a little bit. How do you create incentives for, for uh, good information ecosystems? What kind of policy areas do you see that can nudge people to really make sure that information is clean and good? So is this a question to me first? Or yeah, for you first, yeah. Go on. So um, on YouTube, we have a independent of of COVID nineteen. You know, there's a there's a number of policies where that we enforce to uh, to have uh, users uh, of of YouTube and creators of YouTube play uh, with the rules of uh, of the ecosystem within within YouTube. So um, there's a number of systems, both automatic as well as manual, to detect misleading information, to detect false information, or to detect illegal information. Um, and uh, we not only do this by ourselves and by our user groups that, uh, that re can report uh, any of these uh, videos that fall into one of these categories, but we also intensively work with a crowd of what we call trusted flaggers. Those are um, public institutions, uh, initiatives, NGOs, uh, government institutions that help us to flag um, specific content, specific videos, in their area of specific expertise uh, that can then that could then be treated preferred uh, in our call centers and in our flagging uh, flagging system call centers um, so that we have a system that is uh, that is both efficient and quick in removing and identifying uh, misleading content in of all categories and again this is not related to COVID-19. COVID-19 puts additional pressure puts additional questions on a uh, on, an, on, on an existing um, ecosystem, um, but it's nothing new. So it, it just puts additional questions and we have added um, uh, additional trusted flaggers in Germany and Europe and globally, um, specifically to the COVID-19 crisis. So this is, uh, this is just feeding additional, um, uh, additional inputs and additional valued partners that help us um, to, to operate a better platform on YouTube and also operate um, a better search platform on, on Google's search results um, and, other, and other services. So there's similar mechanisms for Google News, there's similar uh, mechanisms for, uh, for blogging platforms and other products that Google offers. So uh, we're taking this issue, as, as you will hear from all of my colleagues in the space, um, very seriously. And we also have to rely on partners that help us in this, uh, in this uh, very important game. Mm. Uh, Christina, you sit at the nexus of policy and tech. Uh, wh what do you see as ways to nudge uh, uh, individuals, influencers, and others towards uh, giving good information? I think um, it's actually very easy to build on uh, what uh, Jens said. Um, what's certainly true for the for the public space. Um, also, referring back to the hackathon, we experienced and we were using Slack as a main platform and a kind of public private mix space. So there were public channels, but you were also able to create private channels um, where you can't as, a, as an organizer have an overview of everything that's being communicated. 
And I think especially in, in, in this circumstance, in, in those situations, it's very important to have a strong kind of common value system that you um, provide for everyone who participates and to basically give the, that typically silent majority a voice and an ownership of the information that's being shared. Um, we've made really um, good experiences with providing kind of like a structure where people knew where they could um, come to when they had some issues with false information. And um, so it was very easy for someone to, to raise their voice in, in a confidential way um, and provide information to us with, that we could then act upon and like follow up on. Um, and yeah, I think the second thing is um, creating ownership amongst the, the people who contribute information and um, making them aware of like everyone wants to participate or like uh, benefit from um, that common information space. So everyone has to be an owner of the quality of information that's being shared there and help and contribute to um, fa false information not being shared uh, as widely as they could otherwise be. Thanks, uh, uh, Christina. Uh, we don't have any, a lot, any more questions. We definitely don't have any, any verbal questions right now. And we've got a couple written, but they kind of cover uh, similar grounds. So I think we're going to start to wrap up, but I want to ask you guys a final question. Um, and it really takes off of what we just read in that, in that poll, which is, where do you see, we're, we're two months into this crisis here in Germany. You guys sit at the nexus of tech and, and policy. Where do you see the most potential for improvement in Germany? If you were chancellor for a day, what would you like to do? And maybe we could start with Christina and then go to Jens and then to Peter. I wish I had a few seconds to think about this question. <laughs> <laughs> I think one thing that came to my mind immediately is we need to make, so like to create sustainable change based on the things we've started ad hoc um, in the few, last few weeks and support that mindset shift that has come with working remotely, that trusting your employees more, that they do the work without being present all the time, and also being maybe even more productive, um, because a lot of the um, yeah, meeting culture has changed and uh, people have been able to focus more on what they're um, maybe otherwise why they're being holed up in meetings a lot. I think um, that will probably be one thing, like the mindset shift that has come with a lot of, a lot more digitalization and remote work um, that we don't just fall back to the way things were before um, once uh, the crisis will allow us to ease up a bit. It's a great point. Um, uh, Jens. So I think if, if, I look at, if I look at these three pillars that I described earlier, information, education, and, and SMB, how do we support the economy? Um, you can probably say that the corona crisis has, has come to us in, in waves or in phases. The first phase where tech companies needed to, to uh, interact was the information age, where, where we wanted to make sure that we pro provide links to, uh, to help to have people linked to uh, authoritative information. The second phase is how do you make sure that people work from home? How do, we, how do you teach from home? How do you, how do you encourage and, and foster um, the, uh, the workforce from home as much as possible, how do you provide tools? And then the third, the, third, the third phase, now that some of the lockdown mechanisms slowly kind of um, being opened up again, um, you need to make sure that you support the economy by all means, by with offering tools, offering free services, offering training, um, offering, um, offering help and mentorship. And I think this, this phase, if I was, if I was chancellor, um, um, I would, I would invest in that area. How do you make sure, and this is what we also see in the media, obviously, um, it's not gonna be rocket science. So this is gonna be one of the biggest challenges in the, in the economic growth. If you look at the numbers that have just been published today by various media, how much the, uh, the gross domestic product in many European countries and many global countries uh, will have been affected. Um, inflation is, is a big, is a big uh, word that is coming up to everybody's mm -hmm. mouth these days. Mm -hmm. so how do you support companies of, of, of all sizes globally, um, not only through, through funding mechanisms, but also to, in, to empowering them to, to, to leverage the, the potential of digitization. So you know, also in connection with, with one of the questions that we had earlier, I think this crisis also provides a great opportunity for companies of all sizes to leverage the opportunities of digitization 
um, by getting access to, um, to tools faster, by, by using these tools faster, by becoming more digital in, in thinking as well as execution of their businesses. Um, so this, this crisis can also help uh, the, the, the degree of digitization in, in, uh, in countries like Germany. And then lastly, we should not forget, COVID by all means is a major crisis that, that many, um, many societies globally are facing. And I don't want to downplay it, but we have a much bigger crisis, the climate crisis ahead of us. And maybe that curve needs to be flattened too very well. So if I was chancellor, I would not only look at fighting COVID-19, but also fighting the climate crisis. Amen. Oh, the, great, great point. Uh, Peter, uh, you are now chancellor taking over from Chancellor Jens. Uh, what would you do? What, where do we first, need to improve? First, thank you for the kind uh, job offer. So I will give it a thought. Um, so, so that's great. I, from my perspective, I, I think I would go to the point is my last reflect. I mean, this is a historic challenge around the world, right, which you're facing. And, and I think, you know, this represents a unique opportunity for us to rise to this challenge uh, as a country and, and, you know, as a European Union. Um, uh, and think through, you know, how can we leverage, I think, our best capabilities. And I would go to that point of, you know, we've been known as, as the country of, of entrepreneurs, of inventors, you know, of science, all of that. Kind of, you know, there was a bit of Don Wüstenschlaf around it, not in all areas, but you know, we kind of think, you know, things will look for themselves. Now we realize we have to do something about it. So I would say, drive this spirit. You know, we have strong capabilities. Bring this together. You know, we can, you know, I think we can lead this space in, in terms of science and entrepreneurship and find solutions for this challenge. And I think the other aspect which I, which I realized is, that, you know, we have started also to realize how important it is to create this collective spirit, to care for each other and look for each other and, and not just, you know, everybody deals with his or her own questions, but, you know, where do we need to, you know, collectively own the challenge and, and help each other? And I think this other spirit, where, where we saw a lot of great examples, would be something, something I, I would drive and nurture and bring this both together. And generally, it can play, I think, a significant role in, in overcoming the, this, this challenge and find a solution with others together. That's important. All right. Thank you. Thanks so much, Peter. I mean, if I put together a platform from what you guys said, I think it would be a really inspiring platform, to be quite honest. But that's been the, the, the tone of this entire conversation. I mean, I've been really impressed by the optimism. I mean, for international uh, watchers and, and listeners, I mean, there's a lot of optimism. There's a lot of agency here in Germany to look at tech uh, for solutions or to at least enable solutions. Um, and just to pull on what you guys said, uh, uh, Christina, the idea of a mindset shift, I think we've really seen it. Uh, you know, we have, we're forced to jump. We are forced to make leaps of faith. We're all forced to telework. We're forced to do remote learning. Um, but we're, we're succeeding. Uh, you know, not everybody evenly, but it's happening. Um, and that comes to Yinz's point, which is, you know, we need to make sure that we're pulling together those people through mentorship, through training, in every aspect of life, in every aspect of business, um, to make sure that we're getting everybody. And that gets to, to um, Peter's point about a collective spirit and the idea of building that kind of social cohesion is, if we come away from, with one thing from this experience and it's, it's more social cohesion, spirit of collective uh, uh, solidarity, that would be, I think, a real win. Um, thank you guys all for participating and thanks to the audience. This has been a lot of fun. Um, we will be doing the next one next week on Gaia X uh, and and um, digital sovereignty with um, uh, Marco Alexander Breit from the uh, Economic Ministry, uh, Danny Bias uh, from the Bundestag, and others. And we hope that you are able to join. That will also be on the record. But until then, uh, bis zum nächsten Mal. Uh, tschüss. Tschüss. Danke schön. Ja. Tschüss. Danke.